hashtag sisters in law. I'm Jill Wine Banks. I'm Barb McQuaid. I'm Joyce Vance. I'm Kimberly Atkins. And before we get started, let's talk about what we've been doing this week. I loved our conversation last week and missed all of you during the intervening time. So why don't you go ahead and tell us what you were up to, Barb? Well, this week, mostly I spent a lot of time um, explaining to my children who are teenagers and in their early 20s, that it really is called hashtag sisters-in-law. They keep trying to tell me, <laughs> you know, you don't pronounce the hashtag. When, when you're the parent of, of children who are in their teens and early 20s, um, you have to put up with a lot of eye rolling uh, and heavy sighs. You're, you know, immediately uncool and don't get it how the internet works. But I persuaded them it is hashtag sisters-in-law. Um, and in fact, because it's called hashtag sisters in law, it shows up at the top of your feed among your podcasts. So I spent a lot of week explaining that, Jill. Excellent. And what about you, Joyce? Let's see. I, I went on a short trip to the Bahamas and we went out to eat <laughs> dinner at restaurants every night and saw a couple of Broadway shows. Um, of course, we did none of those things because we're still in the teeth of the pandemic, as President Biden said today. Uh, Alabama um, has been slow to roll out vaccines. So I'm uh, at home with my husband and three of my four children. Uh, it's feeling smaller by the day here. But it's, you know, I, I have to say I feel um, in some ways guilty compared to what I know other people are, are going through because we're warm despite the cold weather. Uh, we have plenty, some might say too much to eat. And at least we're with family. So that, I think, for me, has made it a good week. And Kim, what about you? Well, in addition to following uh, what was still a pretty busy news week, I also moved house. I moved in with my fiance uh, and his family, Boogie and I, my dog. Uh, so I've been doing a lot of unpacking, uh, quickly setting up my my Skype TV space uh, and my radio podcast space. Um, so it's been a big adjustment, both uh, physically, a lot of work and also a big you know, milestone in my life. And we have all sent our love and warm wishes on both your move and your engagement. So congratulations you. to you. It's so exciting, Kim. Thank you so much. How about and you, Jill? What have you been doing this week? I had to deal with a huge snowfall and I actually um, had someone shovel the walks, but I decided that I would save my trees that were bending down to the ground, completely touching uh, because of the heavy weight of the snow and took a broom to hit it off and slid down my back stairs and just laid there for a while saying, are all my parts intact? Oh, luckily, no. uh, yeah, luckily I was okay. I think my big puffy coat protected me um, and I'm fine, but I'm gonna be a little more careful. I am very accident prone for those of you who don't know me well. <laughs> I promise you, I am accident prone. But now we're um, waiting for the coldest weekend of the year. It's going to be zero degrees. So that's not going to be so much fun. Um, it's always cold for Super Bowl weekend. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm glad to catch up with all of you. And as everybody knows, and as Barbara just made very clear, we are together. Hashtag sisters-in-law. And this week, we have a lot to talk about. We're going to be taking on the second impeachment of the former president, talking about Merrick Garland and his upcoming confirmation, as well as any other pending confirmations, and the Smartmatic defamation case. And then we're going to answer some of your questions. And I'm really looking forward to that part because we like knowing what you're thinking and what's bothering you. But first, let's talk about the impeachment round two. Donald Trump, of course, is the first president to ever be impeached twice and to have done the second crime in plain view of every member of Congress. In fact, of every constituent of those members of Congress, because it was so public and so frightening. Um, I worry a little that the fright factor is fading and that the words that followed the actual insurrection and breaching of the Capitol building are fading. Are any of you feeling that way? 
I do have that same fear, Jill. The images were so powerful when we were all watching it happen. It seemed like an overwhelming moment. But time creates a certain amount of distance. I hope that when the House managers put on this trial, that we'll not just hear them argue the case, but that we'll see the case again and relive those moments. I think one of the risks that we have at this moment that we have to fight against is that natural tendency to minimize something the further you get away from it. It's sort of a survival mechanism in some ways to avoid reconfronting the horror every day of, of the attack on the Capitol. We need to see those images. They need to be fresh um, from this moment, frankly, not just through impeachment, but through the next couple of times that uh, we as voters go to the ballot box. I, I agree completely. And that raises a good question that I'd love to talk about. And that is, what evidence is going to be presented next week? How are there going to be um, the videos shown? Will there be live witnesses? Um, who do we think are essential? And maybe the first question is, of course, there was talk about the president testifying, and he has turned down the offer. Um, anybody think he should be subpoenaed? Well, I'll talk a little bit uh, about what the, the trial might uh, hold next week. And of course, um, you know, I, I can't shake my uh, DOJ uh, regulations and media policy at this moment. It is an alleged crime, Jill, alleged high crime and misdemeanor. Um, I don't think we want to convict Donald Trump until the, the Senate has a chance to see the case. It reminds me of those a old DOJ habits <laughs> die hard, don't they, Barb? They do. It re reminds me of a, a cartoon in a, a New Yorker once that I saw where um, there is a uh, lawyer representing a client in front of a judge, uh, and you, you hear the lawyer says, um, objection, Your Honor, alleged killer whale. <laughs> <laughs> and the, client, and the drawing of the client is a whale. Um, I, I, I'm not surprised that Donald Trump is not testifying. I mean, number one, I think there's a long tradition in this country of invoking the Fifth Amendment and where we have a right not to incriminate ourselves. We have a, a system that is one based on um, interrogation and not one based on um, there is an adversarial system, not one where you have to confess your own sins. Um, and also, President Trump, as we have seen, is incapable <laughs> of telling a consistent story. Uh, he, um, I'm sure, would have a hard time, d despite coaching by his lawyers, uh, keeping his story straight. So that part doesn't surprise me. Um, I think we are likely to see a lot of video of what happened during the insurrection, and I think that's valuable. And I'll tell you, strategically, I think one thing, if I were advising the House managers about what to do is um, not to spend too much time. Uh, you lose the jury. In this instance, it is the Senate and the American people who are the jury. And if you play these videos too many times over and over again, it, it sort of loses its horror after a while. That was a strategy in the first Rodney King trial with the beatings. They showed the jury these videos over and over again until at some point it became clinical, you know, where they're breaking down frame by frame and it lost that shock value. And so I think, you know, seeing somebody walking through the Capitol with uh, the uh, Confederate flag and you know, spreading feces on um, statues and paintings and walls, uh, walking around with flex cuffs in the House chamber, sitting in the chair, putting their feet on Nancy Pelosi's desk, that's all horrific. And I think you, you show it once and let people remember what that felt like. And also going back, Joyce, to your point about um, has the, uh, the fear, the outrage worn off? I'm not sure it's worn off for those senators who were actually there that day. They lived through that. They're going to have to relive it next week. And I think it's going to remind them of the palpable fear that they felt that day. So um, I think that there is a lot of strategy to be thought about, about how not to overplay one's hand. But there's a lot of good evidence here that can be used persuasively. And Barb, to that point, I mean, the impeachment managers themselves were there. They are themselves, in a way, witnesses to what happened. And I think just even hearing so many of them tell their stories, whether it's on the House floor, whether it's in interviews, have been really so compelling to remind uh Americans to to paint a picture of exactly what really happened. Because even though, as we said, this this event uh, on January 6th played out 
in real time in front of the American people. It was mostly the coverage was from outside. The impeachment managers can really bring to life what was happening inside. And I think that coupled with the video, particularly the video of what Donald Trump actually said, And the reaction of the people in that crowd to what he said as they marched to the Capitol. I think all of those things will be the most critical evidence that the impeachment managers can present. What would your strategy be, Barb? Last night, we saw 199 members of the House vote in favor of letting the Georgia congresswoman who Uh, believes that some of her fellow colleagues should be executed, uh, letting her retain her committee seatings. In the Senate, there's been a similar uh, lack of willingness to hold people in the Republican Party accountable for insurrection. You got to get to 67 to convict the president on impeachment. What do you think the best strategy looks like? Well, I think you want to Or are we really just talking to the American people as the jury, not the Senate? I think so, but the Senate is there as their proxies, right? They represent constituents in those states. And if you can persuade the American people that this was horrific, this goes beyond politics. This isn't about Republican and Democrat. This is about uh, overthrowing our government, stopping um, the certification of an election. And um, I, I would hope that senators are there to represent the people of their districts. And if you can persuade the American people, which I just I can't even believe it's a difficult case, but persuade the American people uh, that this is horrific behavior. We need to send a strong message that it will never be tolerated again. It can't happen in America. Then um, I think maybe the senators go along with that. And I think having been there themselves and feeling that fear that they must have felt when they were there is important. I also think one really interesting dynamic that might make this different from last year's um, impeachment, you know, you have to clarify when you're talking about Donald Trump, which impeachment it was, because there are so many to choose from. But um, last year, the stakes were high because it meant he would uh, be removed from office. He's out of office. And I wonder if now that the stakes are a little bit less high, perhaps some senators might be more willing to come along. I don't know. What do you think, Jill? I, I think that the stakes are very high for the Republican Party. And so that prohibiting him from running ever again is a very good goal. I think there are a number of reasons for this trial. One is just for the historic record to lay out a very clear case. The second is to convince constituents of Republican senators that they need to lobby those senators. I know during Watergate that public pressure made a big difference in the outcome. And I think that this is a case where people were really upset at what they saw But I think it's also to remind the senators of how they felt in that moment, how frightened they were. And I think the videos, I agree with you, you can overdo it. Once and done would be good. But I think there are a lot of live witnesses that can be called who will give, for example, listening to AOC talk about how terrified she was and that she just hoped that she would live to be a mother one day. That move me, and I think it will move other members of Congress. And I think maybe they've learned a lesson. It took the Democrats to vote to remove committee assignments from uh, Congressman Green, but the the Republicans didn't do it. And then she went right back out and is repeating the same trash that she repeated before. And maybe they've learned that ignoring it doesn't make it go away, doesn't make it better, that they're still stuck with her as a member of their party speaking to the public. So I'm hoping that some members of the Senate will come to their senses and go, I saw this happen. If this isn't impeachable, there's no point in having impeachment in the Constitution. And I think that it can happen. Um, I think we're Probably there's so much more to talk about this, and we'll answer questions uh, that you send to us on our Twitter feeds. But Y'all, let's move on. To can, uh, can I just cut in one it. last comment on that? Mm-hmm. One of the most important pieces of evidence that we'll likely see in the impeachment trial involves Trump's reaction to the insurrection. 
He wasn't surprised. In fact, there's a report from Senator Sass that he was delighted. So it would be interesting to see whether or not Senator Sass will testify about how he obtained that knowledge. But certainly if Trump did not intend to incite insurrection, which is the charge against him, he would have reacted more forcefully than reassuring the the rioters when he was finally forced by his staffers to make a public statement that he loved them. Uh, This evidence, you know, just if you were playing it out to a jury in a court of law, would be overwhelming. Because impeachment is a political trial, in essence, we may see a different outcome. Okay, so now I have to add just one last thing, which is— Sorry, my bad. (laughs) It's— I think that his conduct after the insurrection started, when he was getting calls for aid and was still prohibiting assistance being rendered to his own vice president, who was in danger, tells us a lot about what his intent was. The testimony of staff who were with him and said he was actually enjoying watching the television. These are things that are very important pieces of evidence and could sway people to say, He is a danger to our country, to our Congress, to me as a member of Congress, and very important to present that post-evidence. I agree with that. I agree with that completely. Um, But I think we we should move on to our our next topic, uh, which is Merrick Garland. Merrick Garland is someplace that is very familiar to him right now, uh, which is in limbo, (laughs) waiting for a confirmation hearing, a place that he's been before, obviously, when he was nominated uh, by Barack Obama back in 2016 to take the seat of the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia uh, on the U.S. Supreme Court. Now he is waiting for a confirmation hearing as attorney general, a pretty big and important job as Joe Biden seeks to put his cabinet it together. And uh, while Republicans delayed in coming to an agreement with Democrats in the Senate over how they would share control, of course, Democrats have control technically because of the tie-breaking vote of Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, the Republicans dragged their feet a little bit in coming to an agreement, and that gave them enough time uh, with Lindsey Graham holding the gavel as chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee to put off the beginning of the confirmation hearing for Merrick Garland until after the impeachment and also after the budget reconciliation process over this COVID relief bill. So that means that it will probably be weeks before we have a Senate-confirmed attorney general at the top of the Justice Department at a time, of course, that a lot needs to be done at the Justice Department after we have seen, as I wrote in a column today in the Boston Globe, uh, Many years of attorney generals under attorneys general under President Trump uh, really rolling back a lot of the policies that Joe Biden believes in. Uh, There was a a denial, frankly, of the importance of right wing uh, right wing extremism and the threat that it posed, despite DOJ's own data that shows that posed the greatest uh, threat to Americans and and a lack of um, will really to address that. We saw the Black Lives Matter movement uh, throughout all of last year demanding criminal justice reform. That needs to be done. And oh yeah, we have uh, insurrectionists, alleged insurrectionists, Barb, um, who uh, need to be Uh, prosecuted and investigated. And yet we have no permanent uh, person at the top of the Justice Department. Uh, To me, that move felt like the same kind of obstructionism that we saw from uh, Mitch McConnell during the Obama administration when he said when he vowed to make Obama a one term president. But it's also uh, important to me because I think a lot of things that need to one of the most important things that need to be done at the Department of Justice is to depoliticize it, depoliticize the department, depoliticize um, U.S. attorney's offices. And so I want to throw it to y'all. I'll start with Joyce Uh, as a former U.S. attorney. Talk a little bit about why there needs to be the, the politics need to be taken out of the DOJ in the way that they do their work. If you ask any career prosecutor in one of the 94 U.S. attorney's offices across the country, 
Um, here's a little piece of DOJ trivia. 94 offices, only 93 U.S. attorneys, because Guam and the Mariana Islands share a U.S. attorney. So if that ever comes up on Jeopardy, now you're prepared to answer the question. <laughs> but I promise you that every single one of those process, prosecutors would tell you that their job has nothing to do with politics. It's about the law and it's about justice. And the reality of being DOJ or of being a U.S. attorney's office is that you can only be effective. You can only do your job when the community trusts you and has faith in you, because ultimately you have the ability to put people in prison, to take them away from their families and to put them behind bars. And if communities don't believe that you're exercising that power wisely and in a way that serves the interests of the community, then you begin to lose your ability to be effective. So President Trump, in order to serve his own purposes, in order to protect himself from prosecutions, went on the attack against DOJ. He named prosecutors, which was particularly heinous. He attacked the FBI. He attacked the intelligence community. And, and there is some data available that shows that public trust in law enforcement and the Justice Department has flagged as a result of that. So it's critical that we get Judge Garland confirmed as attorney general so that he can begin to assemble his team and help to restore confidence in DOJ. You know, prosecutors are not used to going out to the public and selling themselves. But I think, un unfortunately, we're at a point in time where Everyone from the top leadership in the department to U.S. attorneys will have to show an, an unusual willingness to engage with their communities. You can't talk about ongoing investigations, but we can talk about process. I, I shouldn't say we anymore. They can talk about process, how they do things, what the standards and the rules are. People are very curious. DOJ will need to sort of pull back the layers of the onion and let the public in a little bit and reestablish its credibility so it can perform its important mission, which is keeping all of us safe. Yeah. And to that point, I mean, I want to um, point out one of the things that Attorney General Barr did, which was sort of lift this um, bar against starting investigations very close to an election that involve uh, elections. That that was an important rule that was put in place because the DOJ doesn't want to make it seem as if it will try to influence the way that people might vote. But that was rolled back. It does not seem that any of the U.S. attorneys actually took that as an invitation, took that invitation to actually open up any public investigations into invest, into election fraud, alleged election fraud. Uh, but Barb, talk a little bit about those rules that are in place and, and what Merrick Garland might be seeking to do. Yeah, I mean, my guess is that when he comes into office, there will be a number of policies that he will look at to consider changing. And for every day that goes by that he's not in office, he l loses the opportunity to do that. When um, I was in the Justice Department, one of the people we had a chance to work with was Tom Perez, uh, who was at that time the Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division. And he had been in um, an the Clinton administration. I remember him telling us repeatedly um, you got to think of it as the sand is going through the hourglass. You have um, a finite number of minutes to do this job. It's four years and then the sand runs out and your opportunity to, use, to do good, to make positive change, to change policies, to improve uh, the equality of the criminal justice system, whatever it is you want to do, the sand runs out. And if you're starting late, then you're missing out on uh, some of those opportunities to do some of those things. Um, so I think every day that goes by is a missed opportunity. Now, I think we're in good hands in the interim. The acting attorney general is someone named Monty Wilkinson. He's someone Joyce and I know pretty well. Um, and he is a career professional. He's been there a long time. He came from the Justice Management Division. He's a solid uh, career professional person. But, uh, you know, he's a caretaker. He is not going to uh, shake anything up, I don't think. Uh, you know, that's typically not his mission. He's made a few policy changes, uh, like one I know that he has issued already was to rescind the zero tolerance policy that Jeff Sessions had put in place to prosecute all persons who have entered the country uh, illegally, felonies or misdemeanors, every one of those had to be prosecuted. Um, and, you know, as uh, most of us can appreciate, when you use your 
prosecutorial resources in one case, that means you're not using them in another case. So when you take a zero tolerance position on uh, misdemeanor illegal entry cases, that means you, you don't have those resources to work on something that might be more important that day. So he's doing some things like that, you know, making sure that uh, the trains are running on time and some modest policy changes are made. But I think we likely won't see any of those major policies until we have a new attorney general. And um, I don't know that we're going to see any of those other positions filled, you know, those important positions that assistant attorney general like uh, some of these other divisions and um, some of the U.S. attorney positions. So uh, precious sands are falling through the hourglass every minute that goes by. Yeah, I I think the delay is obviously a problem, but I want to talk about a possible solution to that. And that is for Merrick Garland to be named the acting attorney general. In the full knowledge that he will eventually be confirmed, there's no way that he won't be confirmed because, one, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee is now my senator and uh, will proceed to the confirmation, and it only takes a majority. So that means that the Democrats will confirm him, and he can start on his job right now. Um, And I just don't see why we don't do that or why the president doesn't do that so that we can have him. And I want to point out how important he is, particularly um, after Watergate, the attorney general replacement was also from Chicago. Merrick Garland actually is from my hometown of Skokie and went to Niles High School, which is where I also went. So yay for Chicago. Um, And I think that what is needed is something like what happened after Watergate. It was Edward Levy from the University of Chicago, who was really not a political person. He was really someone who restored integrity to the Department of Justice. And as you know, I started my career at DOJ. I love DOJ. And I'll repeat what Joy said, which is the first thing we learn is that we do justice and that we have to do what the public is willing to accept. So That's something that has been totally lost in the uh, pantheon of attorneys general under Donald Trump. And so I want to see him appointed today. And I don't want to wait till after the impeachment and the trials next week. And then the Senate goes on recess. So that's another two weeks. Why should we wait? Don't, isn't there a possibility that, uh, I, I know it's not ideal to be the acting But if you're the acting who is under nomination to be the permanent, why not? I think there might be some technical rules, Jill, that he'd have to come in and serve in a high level official capacity for like 90 days or something like that before he can be acting. So I don't know that there's time to, you know, Matt Whitaker came in and served on Jeff Sessions' staff for a little while before he became. So I think anyone who's already Senate confirmed or a senior official who's been working in the administration for 90 days is, well, but he um, is Senate confirmed. He's Senate confirmed as oh, that's a, a good judge. Point. That's and a good I, point. And I just had a conversation with Adam Gentleson, who was the deputy chief of staff to Harry Reid when he was the leader. And he confirmed that he thought it was a possibility. So wow. um, I, I think the Vacancies Act would allow it. And we know that In the Trump administration, people confirmed in one agency were transferred to another agency. And so if it worked for them, it could work for us. I don't think the Democrats frequently take all the power that they have and use it in the same way that the Republicans have. Wow. Just a possibility. So here's one implication. Here's one implication of not confirming the attorney general. You know, to make concrete, Jill, what you're saying and what Barb's saying about the need to get on with it, um, whether it can be done as you suggest or not, we'll see early this spring uh, the George Floyd case, or at least parts of it, will go to trial. We will see similar cases related to excessive force by police go to trial in criminal settings. Those cases, and I'm sure we'll talk about this um, in coming weeks, those cases can be very difficult for prosecutors to get convictions in, in large part because of the state of mind you have to prove for police officers involved in shooting, but also because of a, a defense called qualified immunity that gives them more latitude to act than, than it does to general citizens. You know, this came up in the Ferguson 
situation, which happened near the end of the Obama administration, where it wasn't possible to prosecute criminally. But what DOJ was able to do was to use something called the consent decree process to force those departments to reform their practices, where they had had systemic problems, to force them to redo their training and their standards and and to come under DOJ scrutiny so that these horrible incidents would not continue to happen. Jeff Sessions, as attorney general, discontinued the use of consent decrees. So one of the most important things we need is to see Judge Garland confirmed, to see Kristen Clark confirmed as the assistant attorney general for the Civil Rights Division, so that if we're not able to obtain prosecution or convictions in those cases, then the departments can be forced and DOJ has the tools to fix that problem. Barb, can I just like say you qu- had something to say. I, I, I just wanted to say a quick word about consent decrees. We had one in the, with the Detroit Police Department during the time I was a U.S. attorney. And I think sometimes people see this as, you know, an us versus them, that you have to be for the police or against the police, and that Jeff Sessions was the champion of police departments by removing this tool from prosecutors. But the chief of police in Detroit will tell you that this was a gift. This was a great thing. It caused the police department to become a constitutional police department. It is now a model of best practices around the country. And it brought in the resources that he couldn't do on his own to to transform the police department. So um, I think everybody wants a police department that works equitably for everybody in a community, that has the trust of the community it serves. And if the Justice Department can come in and bring resources and try to, and, and the expertise, frankly, that it takes to transform departments, then everybody should welcome that. I agree with that wholeheartedly, especially since so little of police reform can be done at a federal level. This is really a state and local issue. And this is one of those few tools that can be used to bring to bear the resources of the federal government in uh, on this on this as well. Related to this is another reason why we need Merrick Garland and leadership at the top um, is the misunderstanding that people now have about DOJ having dropped the lawsuit against Yale. Um, People think that that was against civil rights, but actually the lawsuit was against affirmative action. And I don't think people even have a public spokesman who's made that clear. I get a lot of questions on Twitter about why would the Biden administration go against affirmative action? And it's not. It's the lawsuit that the Trump administration filed against Yale was to stop affirmative action. And they filed it that way on purpose to make it look as if it was some sort of civil rights uh, claim when it was actually essentially in a way that I find really repugnant, using Asian American students as pawns in order to stop affirmative action programs that are aimed to increase the minority population of the student body in in schools like Yale and Harvard. Okay, I'm going to throw it to Joyce. We can talk about this all day, but I'm going to throw it to Joyce to talk about another really interesting case involving civil law and defamation. So the Smartmatic case is the case that you're talking about, Kim. And this is a fascinating one. This week, a company called Smartmatic sued Fox News. It sued three of its hosts, Lou Dobbs, Maria Bartiromo, and Janine Pirro. And it also sued Trump lawyers Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani. The lawsuit alleges defamation. It's a a group of claims, but they all come down to defamation. And Smartmatic is a company that makes voting machines. The lawsuit gets filed, as Kim says, it's a civil case, in state court in New York. So this might be one of my favorite pleadings of all time. And for those of you out in podcast land who haven't had a chance to take a look at this complaint yet, I'm just going to read you a little snippet from the introduction. Here's how it starts. The earth is round. Two plus two equals four. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris won the 2020 election for president and vice president of the United States. The election was not stolen, rigged, or fixed. These are facts. They are demonstrable and irrefutable. What a great start to a lawsuit. I've, I've never heard anything quite like that. So, Barb, talk with us a little bit about what the lawsuit is about. What are the claims that Smartmatic is making? Yeah, there's um, uh, 16 different claims, all claiming defamation, that Fox News and various of its hosts and guests made false statements that 
these Smartmatic uh, voting machines, and they 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 make uh, software and hardware for voting. Uh, that they were somehow involved in fixing and rigging the election in favor of Joe Biden. It's completely false, and it has harmed their business. You know, they they sell their software and hardware to communities. The only one they worked in in the 2020 election was in Los Angeles County. Uh, nonetheless, that fact has not gotten in the way of spreading uh, falsehoods that they uh, were involved in election ir irregularities in many other states. Uh, you know, there are allegations like uh, they were owned by the same company that owned another voting uh, election software and hardware company that was launched by Hugo Chavez, the leader of Venezuela, who is now dead, you know, all kinds of crazy allegations. But it's very interesting. They are seeking $2.7 billion in damages because they say this will harm the reputation of our business. There will be some communities who will say, I heard Rudy Giuliani say on national television that this uh, company uh, produced uh, goods that rigged an election. We want to have fair elections in our community. And so I think they've alleged very strong claims. They specify all 16 of these claims that they're seeking. It includes, as you mentioned, Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell, lawyers pr for President Trump, as well as some of the Fox News hosts. So um, it'll be an interesting case going forward, but looks to be one that's very strong. It's utterly fascinating, right? It's not just one instance of defamation. And they say in the complaint that this happened over and over, night after night on Fox, where it reached millions of viewers. It really sets it apart from any other defamation or libel case that I've ever seen. Jill, you had something to say. Yeah, I just wanted to add, although they were only involved in the 2020 election in Los Angeles County, they are a very large international operation. They do machines in many, many foreign countries. And so at first when I read it, I thought, oh, whoever heard of them and how could they be hurt to the point of $2.7 billion? And then I looked at the rest of it and you can see how they could lose dramatic business. Now, of course, in proving the case, if Smartmatic doesn't get a settlement offer, which they might, um, but if they don't and have to go to trial, they're going to have to prove their actual damages and show what business they actually lost, not just that they hypothetically are losing business because of the defamation. Um, and they also are going to have to show they aren't a public um, figure so that the standard of proof doesn't get raised. Um, in defamation cases, if you're just an ordinary citizen, then you can just prove that it was false. If you're a public figure, you might have to also prove that it was malicious, that the speaker knew it was false, although I think that would probably be pretty easy to prove in this case that anybody saying that knew that it was false. Uh, but it's going to be a very interesting case, and it's very interesting that it might be a civil defamation case that takes down Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, Fox News and its hosts, and they were very careful to sue the news hosts, not the opinion hosts, uh, because opinion is opinion, but news is supposed to be true. It's supposed to actually be based on fact. So I think this is going to be very interesting. And it, it also shows uh, the defamation cases against Trump may be powerful in controlling Trump, Summer Zervos and uh, E.J. E. G., e. J. Carroll. Um, have lawsuits pending for defamation. And, and falsehoods can get people in trouble. When we turned over the briefcase full of evidence and a roadmap to impeachment at the end of our, when we indicted uh, the defendants in Watergate, we gave it to the House. And one of the areas that we provided evidence that we felt was impeachable was for all the lies. We had a list of the president said X, here's the facts. And um, I, I think that this could be very interesting against the president as well as Fox News. So it's interesting, you know, usually we talk about criminal cases, but this is a civil case. What's different about a civil case? What kind of outcome could we ultimately expect here? 
Well, I think one of the biggest uh, potential outcomes of this is beyond the money, right? I mean, one of the things that these plaintiffs are going to be looking for is for the news organizations that spread this false disinformation to go on air and with the same vigor, uh, correct the record. I mean, it's really they're seeking the best fact check uh, that you could possibly get. I mean, the people who watch Fox News and these other organizations that are being sued, they don't they don't read PolitiFact, right? They don't they don't care about the Washington Post and their Pinocchios. But if they are sitting and watching this and they see these same uh, hosts and anchors say there is no evidence that these organizations, that the manufacturers of these voting machines committed fraud, that the things that were said and they'll have to go through. We've already seen it happen a little bit with it, with the Dominion suits uh, on, on Newsmax and other organizations um, have to give these corrections. Um, and, and so that is going to be an important thing. And think about it. For so in, in so many ways, we've been talking about how um, to hold folks accountable for the big lie. This, this falsehood that there was election fraud that was perpetuated by uh, the president and, and all these other people. And we're saying we don't know if there will be a conviction uh, in the impeachment trial. So we don't know if there might be uh, accountability there for the alleged uh, incitement of insurrection. We know that the people who participated in those events on January 6th are being prosecuted. But that's not going to reverse the disinformation that that cause them to to engage in this really horrific act. But if you can get at the disinformation itself, that's really important. And it's these civil suits that might be the best way to do that. What do you think, Barb? Yeah, that's very interesting. You know, you mentioned disinformation, and that is the way this lawsuit is framed. They talk about it as this is a dis part of a disinformation campaign. And so it seems like that may be the comeuppance that matters most, right? Rather than criminal prosecution, but all these defamation suits, as Jill mentioned, the women who are suing Donald Trump and, and this one. And the other thing uh, that we saw that was a little bit unusual was the filing in uh, Michigan of a motion for sanctions against Sidney Powell uh, for the filing of a frivolous lawsuit. Um, there's a rule in civil procedure that says if you file a lawsuit that's not well grounded in fact in law, the lawyer and the party could be liable for, for monetary sanctions, a financial penalty. But rule judges 11. are fair. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> rule 11 for, for 200. Um, <laughs> judges are very reluctant though, to award those. It's very, very rare. But if ever there was a case where they should be awarded, I think you might be able to argue that the lawsuit that Sidney Powell filed in Michigan, like many others that were filed around the country, that had uh, was not well-grounded, in fact. It was a frivolous allegation that there was f fraud in the election. It was filed before a federal district judge in Detroit, who summarily dismissed it and said there's absolutely no basis for this lawsuit and dismissed it. And so now uh, there's a motion pending for sanctions. I think the granting of sanctions in a case like that could have a very powerful deterrent effect on some of these frivolous lawsuits going forward. And just like this lawsuit, if uh, Smartmatic is able to get $2.7 billion or something close to it and a retraction from Fox News, that could go a long way towards stopping disinformation in a way that perhaps criminal prosecution cannot. The That's disinformation point. point is a great one because before you can file a defamation lawsuit, you actually have to reach out to people before you sue them, put them on notice that you're planning on filing a suit, and give them a set amount of time in which to retract the false statement. And so that's what happened here. They actually reached out to Fox and said, if you don't retract your statements within a certain number of days, we'll sue you. Fox and the other defendants chose not to retract. Obviously, they thought that that would be problematic for them for whatever reason. So to see them potentially being forced to do that in the context of this lawsuit, I think that that underlines how important the comments that y'all are making. And it's not just for this suit. It could be for the next lawsuit. For instance, the Lincoln Project has a situation where they have actually put someone on notice and demanded a retraction. Future defendants might be a little bit quicker to retract, and perhaps what we are seeing here is the real way to hold Trump and other people who spread disinformation accountable. So who would have, have ever a thought question. that it would come through a civil case? 
I have a question about what I think is a really excellent pleading, very compelling, very well done. But I just wonder if anybody feels that possibly they went a little too far in saying that this is what caused the insurrection and whether that has any relevance to damages to Smartmatic. Well, I don't think they have to prove that, right? I mean, all they have to prove is that there was false uh, statements that made about their reputation that will cause harm. So I I agree, it's probably uh, a little bit sensational and it's a little bit superfluous um, because if they if they have to set out to prove that, they've made their job a lot harder. Yeah. I don't think they do, but I suppose if you are a defendant, you might ask to strike that as super, superfluous. But this is a civil case, not a criminal case. So right. the burden of proof is lower for the allegations that they make. I think it was perhaps put in there deliberately for that reason. It might be a savvy move, or as Barb says, a judge might go ahead and strike it as scandalous and superfluous. You say so, superfluous better than I do, Joyce. Well done. Superfluous. <laughs> it's my southern accent. Um, so, much. Barb, we have questions from our listeners. Should we go ahead and move on to those questions? All right, let's do it. Each week, we will be taking your questions. You can write us at sistersinlaw at politicon.com, or you can send us a tweet using hashtag sistersinlaw. If we don't get your que- to your question in the show, we will try to answer as many of them as we can on our Twitter feeds throughout the week. So let's take a couple of them. We've got one from Diane in Monrovia, California, who's at DLogan34. Um, and Diane says, it seems in general, people are shrugging their shoulders as if there are no laws to charge the insurrectionists other than trespassing and assault. Can you talk more about potential charges? Well, let me answer Diane, since she's from really close to my neck of the woods. I grew up in the Pasadena area, which is just next door to Monrovia. So hi, Diane. Um, The answer, I think, in part at least, is this. What we're seeing prosecutors do right now is bring easy charges, accessible charges, so that they can make arrests, in some cases take people who pose an ongoing risk, uh, and, and incapacitate those folks so that they can't do any more harm. What we'll see as DOJ continues its investigative work will be superseding indictments. That means that they'll amp up some of these more basic charges with more serious charges where they're available. So people who are originally charged with the federal equivalent of trespassing might ultimately face charges for assault or any other crimes that they were involved in. The the last thing that I would say is some people have suggested that it's a problem that we don't have a domestic terrorism statute. And having done a lot of domestic terrorism work, I'm not too worried about that. The fact that there's no specific statute means that every statute on the books is a domestic terrorism statute. And I have charged everything from tax code violations to fake ID violations in an effort to bring domestic terrorists to justice. There is a lot of statutory room out there for prosecutors to hold these folks accountable. I would say that conspiracy is one of the big ones that people are not talking enough about, Um, and even felony murder, because when they undertook to reach the Capitol, to break in, to break the glass, to push aside barriers and police officers, and some of them came armed, and they did serious injury to many uh, of the Capitol police, That makes them all responsible in the same way that the getaway driver who's waiting outside the bank doesn't pull the gun that kills the guard. He is he or she is also responsible for the murder of the guard because they were part of the conspiracy to rob the bank. And here they're all part of the conspiracy to violate the sanctity of our government and to breach the Capitol. So I think there are some very serious crimes that could be charged. All right, let me move on to uh, another question. We've got this one from Carol in Salt Lake City, Utah. She says, I am dismayed hearing about so many serious threats made to politicians. Can't the individuals who make these threats be prosecuted? So the answer is, yes, they can be in some cases where the threats are indicative of a desire to do violence. You know, we all have 
First Amendment rights, but there's a point in time where that line can be crossed. And if you do make an actual threat to do harm to someone, there are specific statutes involving threats against members of Congress. We've seen that invoked in a case involving Nancy Pelosi and other ways to bring folks to justice and accountability. These cases can be tough to investigate because they sometimes turn on the state of mind of the person who made the threat. And it's really tough to get inside of someone's head and figure out what their intent was That means prosecutors and investigators have to look for context. What conversations were these folks having with people around them? Did they actually go out and buy a gun if they said they were going to shoot someone? So so don't mistake um, a failure to be quick and speedy about bringing prosecutions over events like this. As we saw in Michigan over the summer, and maybe that's something that Barb can speak to, but we did have threats against the governor and others in Michigan, and and they were responded to with indictments by law enforcement. Yeah, I'll just say briefly, one of the phenomena that we have seen here in Michigan that is very disturbing is um, protesters going to the homes of elected officials and protesting at their homes with weapons. Um, You know, if they're in a public space on a sidewalk or on a street, there's no crime uh, for them to gather and assemble and protest that way. But it can be very intimidating. Uh, I know our Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson tweeted about how she was inside her house watching how the Grinch stole Christmas with her young son while there were armed protesters outside her home. Um, It's not illegal. They have the right to do that. But it strikes me as... um, crossing a, a line that is um, makes it dangerous to hold public office in a way that I think is unhealthy for a democracy. We want to encourage people to run for public office. And if you know that your family's safety might be put at risk, I think there's worry about that. A lot of it comes online. And as Joy said, the question is whether it is someone speaking their mind about uh, di- you know displeasure with a, a, an elected official's conduct and decisions or what is known as a true threat, and that is a specific threat to injure or kill a particular person, which is prosecutable. And I think in this case, uh, Barb, because it is so difficult, as as you and Joyce correctly point out, to bring criminal charges and to use the criminal system as the as the uh, cure for this, that it needs to be a political solution. I think it needs to be bipartisan condemnation across the board uh, from office seekers, from from office holders, to say that this is unacceptable. This type of threat, this type of violence against people who have been elected to do the business of the American people, even if you disagree with their views, that this type of threat is not acceptable. And I think if we saw more of that, uh, perhaps that would help also to tamp down that level of uh, anger and vitriol that is thrown, uh, not just at you know members of, uh, not just elected officials, I'm sure the four of us have our share of uh, things in our inboxes that we get. And it's just uh, such a polarized and and a vitriolic time that it is a really big problem. And, and if we had our leaders stepping up and, and condemning it, perhaps that would uh, go at least a little bit of the way to, to stopping it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think there has to be some um, uh, public condemnation to it, you know, so it's not normalized. Let me read one last question, Jill. Maybe we can ask you to chime in on this. Sarah in Orlando has asked, what do you mean by senior status with respect <laughs> to judges? If a judge has senior status, can the president replace him? Senior status is a voluntary uh, act by a judge who reaches a certain age. And my friends who are judges are of that certain age. And some of them have taken senior status. Um, And it simply means that they don't have a full caseload, but they do maintain their office. They do hear cases. They do do trials, but it's just not a full load. And no, they can't be replaced. They can be replaced as the judge um, that they were. They stay s- senior and for as long as they want to stay senior status. And, but yes, that means that all of the judges who were waiting and announced on inauguration day that they were going to senior status meant that there were vacancies that President Biden can now name people to. And because we only need 51 votes to confirm those judges, the process should move forward quickly, and I hope that it will. That brings us to the end of the show. 
Thank you for listening to Hashtag Sisters in Law. As Barb pointed out, hashtag is part of our name. Hashtag Sisters in Law with Kim Atkins, Barb McQuaid, Jill Winebanks, and me, Joyce Vance. Don't forget to send us your questions so we can answer them next Friday and every Friday. Our email address is sistersinlaw at politicon.com. You can also tweet your questions to us using hashtag sistersinlaw. We would love it if you would listen to us every week. You can subscribe at hashtag sistersinlaw on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And we hope you'll give us a rating. I hope that we've earned five stars. We'd love to hear your comments. It's important to us to know what you're thinking about. See you next week with another episode. Hashtag sisters-in-law. <laughs>